Pharisees called him a devil because they brushed their doctrines aside. And soldiers called him the king of the Jews and they mocked him as he hung and died. Pilate called him an innocent man, tried to wash blood off his hands. But the crowd called aloud and they say, You can't be win, brother. That man, but I call him father. Good to see you in the house of the Lord. Have you got me on right here? Okay. Good to see each one of you here in the house of the Lord tonight. Can everybody just pull it in tight, please? I don't like this every other road. Do you? And I'm praying this old mess. We're praying God just to destroy all of this mess. And uh, I don't like having to be, be spaced out like this. But nevertheless, we're glad to be in the house of God. Even if we have to skip roads, it's good to be here. That's better than the alternative of not being here, right? We're glad to have all of you here this evening. So good to have each of our visitors with us. We have folks here from Lights for Christ Holiness Church, Brother Floyd, and a lot of his congregation. Glad to see them tonight. It's good to have some of our dear dear friends on this earth, Brother Tim Dean and his family. And uh, you're looking at uh, the future president, Brother Jacob. If the Lord tarries, that boy will be president, and he will be a Republican president, and we will vote for him. Is that right? We will. So be good to that young man. Some of you might be in jail and need to have him to help get you out. We're glad to have Nathan. Nathan's a preacher man, and we're just glad God's helping him. He just got his license, went through MIP, and the Lord's using him. He's working as a youth pastor. And uh, I'm just proud, I'm proud of what God's doing, aren't you? God's not dead, God's alive and well. We told you last evening, God baptized that young boy with the Holy Ghost on Sunday morning at their home church. He saved Christian on uh, Sunday morning at their home church. And God's just looking for a vessel, that's all he needs, amen? We're glad to have folks in the Big Oak Church of God. Appreciate them being with us tonight. Folks from West Ashboro, thank you all for being here All of our visitors, wherever you're from, we're glad that you're here. Now, listen, we don't have to wait. Now, if you're a Christian, we don't have to try to, you know, shake hands and hug necks to be united. If you were washed by the blood, we are automatically united when we come together. So I I see the body of Christ here tonight. Let's worship God together as that body. Amen. I want to stand to go to the Lord in prayer this evening. We want to pray. Brother Baker has a special request. Uh, the Lord knows what it is. We want to ask the Lord to help him in this situation. Anybody else have a special request tonight, special needs? God knows what they are. Let's pray for one another. Let's pray for our churches. Let's pray for revival. Let's pray for this service tonight that God will just come down and have his way in the house of God. Join with us. Let's pray. Father, we ask you right now, Lord, that you just have your way in this service tonight. We pray, God, that you'll touch every man, woman, boy, and girl. Under the sound of our voice tonight, we thank you, God, for all of those that's come out this way on a Tuesday evening to be together in service and to worship you in spirit and truth. Pray, God, you'll bless the singing tonight. We pray you'll bless the gifted giver. Pray that you'll meet the need of this evangelist this week, Lord. I pray, God, you'll bless Brother Jones tonight as he preaches the word of God. Bless the message and the messenger tonight, Father. We thank you, Lord, for your saving grace. Thank you for the power of the blood that sets free, God, that that saves us from the penalty of sin and the power of sin. God, we thank you for all the pastors here tonight, Lord. I I pray that you'll bless them, bless their congregations. Send revival to us, dear Lord. We pray for every lost soul, God, those that we know and those that we don't. We pray for backsliders, God, that they'll come home and they'll get back right with you, Lord. Pray for the sick, those that are sick spiritually, those that are sick physically, God. We pray for healing tonight. We pray for those watching online, God, that you'll touch them right there where they are. Father, everything that's done tonight, we want to give you the praise and all the glory. In Jesus' name we pray. Can you just lift up your hands and just love the Lord tonight and thank him for the privilege and opportunity we have to be in his house tonight. Amen. Now give God a hand of praise as you're seated. You're glad to be saved. Amen. We can rejoice because our names are written in heaven. Very quickly before the ushers come, 
uh, we, we do have a CD sign-up sheet, uh, but we're going to let you just uh, get with Brother Dean back there if you want to get CDs from this week. Uh, be patient with him. Give him time. Uh, if you're not from the home church, if you'll just give him your phone number, he'll write it down when they're ready. Uh, we'll give you a call, and it won't be too long. And uh, so please just let him know, and uh, he'll put your name on a list and get you ready, and uh, he'll make those CDs for you. All right? I asked Sister Shelton today. I said, did I talk too much, too much last evening? And she said, it doesn't matter. I said, but did I? She said, it doesn't matter. I said, did I talk too much last evening? She said, yes, you did. <laughs> but it does not matter because you're going to do it anyway. So pray for me tonight. I'm going to try not to be too long up here. I'm going to get up and get down and let the preacher get up here, and we're going to have church. Amen? I want every pastor to stand very quickly. Every pastor stand, preacher, every minister stand. Let's give these, let's give these men of God a hand of appreciation. I love them so much. Appreciate them. I've got Brother Tim Dean here. Brother Floyd's here. Brother Jimmy Jones is here. Brother Josh comes here. And I just wonder what I've done to be so blessed to be around such wonderful men of God. Amen, Brother Nathan. I've been blessed. God's been good to us. Amen. All right, ushers, come on, please. Brother Josh, I want you to come pray over this offer tonight. We want you to give everything that's rendered is going to our evangelist. I appreciate him. Uh, he is driving back and forth. I believe about an hour and 20 minutes, hour and a half each way. And uh, it costs money to go up and down that road. I appreciate everything that you've rendered thus far. We want to get a good offering tonight. Uh, I appreciate everything that you brought, the goodies that you brought. Let's keep bringing those. And, uh, Let's bless him richly. Amen. Brother Albright, no, not you. Come on, brother. You go ahead and pray with us. Dear Heavenly Father, Lord, we thank you today, God. We praise you, Lord, for all that you've, that all that you've done during this meeting, God. We thank you, Lord, for your rich message, God, for the, your rich word. God, we ask you, Lord, to touch this evangelist while he's here. God, use this offering, Lord. Bless the givers. God, we be careful, Lord, to give you the praise and the honor and the glory for it. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. God bless you for your giving tonight. My girls are going to come and sing. While they're coming, I, I read a story. Uh, I shared this with the home folks. I read a story of a, uh, a man who bought two new bird dogs, and they were good dogs and strong dogs, good hunting dogs. And he put those dogs out in his backyard, and he said on a Monday morning he noticed a bulldog coming down the sidewalk in front of his house. That dog began to burrow under the fence and got underneath that fence, went into where those two bird dogs were, and immediately those two bird dogs attacked that bulldog, and they're all fighting, and he said there was hair flying everywhere until finally that bulldog couldn't take any more, and he took off back under the fence, back home. He said that went on for a week, every morning about the same time. Here came that bulldog back under that fence, right back fighting those two bird dogs until he couldn't take any more, right back home. He said, I had to go out of town on Friday that evening. He said, so Saturday I called my wife. He said, I was just curious. I wonder if he came back again on that Saturday morning while I wasn't there. His wife said, sure enough, about the same time, here he come again. She said, but this time when he come under the fence, she said, our two dogs come flying to the house. Scratching on the door, whimpering and whining, trying to get in the house to get away from that bulldog. She said, I let them in. That bulldog's out there in the yard now just walking around like he owns all of this. The point of that is this. You may get knocked down. You may feel outnumbered. But you keep fighting the good fight of faith. I said, you keep fighting. Don't ever quit. Don't ever give up. 
I'm telling you, with God on our side, the devil's no match for any child of God. Can you say amen? The Apostle Paul said, fight the good fight of faith. So you keep pressing in, child of God. God's going to give you the victory. Can you say amen tonight? Let's worship with the girls tonight. Praise God.
before and God's done it again and again and again. Thank God. Let's lift our hands and love him tonight. What a mighty God we serve. That song says angels bow before him, heaven and earth adore him. What a mighty God we serve. Amen. I tell you, we got enough folks, enough God here to have a move of God and have church in this house tonight. Amen. Praise God. God's never let us down. He's never failed us. He is a faithful God. Amen. Again, we're glad to have each one of you here tonight. Thank you. Thank you for coming out this way on a Tuesday night. All those watching online, thank you uh, for watching and being part of these services. Let me encourage you again before Brother Jones comes. Let me encourage you to please share these services online. So share those on your Facebook page with your friends and families. Tell people about them. Folks that can't be here, maybe they can watch them uh, sometime later this week or sometime later. But uh, we want to make sure we get this, these messages out. It's going to help somebody. I want to see people's lives changed, saved, sanctified, baptized with the Holy Ghost and fire. Amen. Nothing takes the place of the preaching of the Word of God. Can you say amen? Give Brother Jones a hand as he comes to bless us with the Word. Tonight. I never saw him. at all. I never saw him walk on water. I do believe he did. I never saw him turn water into wine. I do believe he did. I never saw him raise Lazarus from the dead. I do believe he did. But I have seen the things he's done for me. And can't nobody change my mind about that. Didn't I walk on the water? Hallelujah. I believe that he did. Glad you're in the house of the Lord. I turned off the road and looked at all the cars in the parking lot and I got a shock of my life. I knew that the deans were coming. You can count on them. They're like clockwork. They'll, they'll drive three hours like that. Great, great friends. I appreciate them so much. If, if, uh, if, if Jacob becomes president then Nathan's going to be his advisor. He's going to be like going to be like Billy Graham. I appreciate this family. So glad you're all in the house. Lord, good to have our brother Pastor back, and those of you that are here, many faces that don't recognize, don't know. But as the pastor said, if we belong to Jesus, we are family. And I appreciate you being in the house, Lord. My delight to be here, and uh, I appreciate this this uh, what many people in our day call first family. The the Sheldons appreciate them so much, and the invitation to be in the house of the Lord. I'm preaching. Well, I've been around the block a time or two. Been preaching long enough now that the most of the men I preach for are younger than me. Uh, when I started out 36 years ago, uh, 31 full time, uh, about everybody was older than me. Uh, but when you live long enough that everybody preaching or pastoring is younger than you, uh, that says something. I don't know if it's all good. You know, somebody said about birthdays, enough of them things will kill you. Uh, but I do appreciate them so very much in the Lord. I believe that we are the generation to see the return of Jesus Christ. I believe we're that generation. And the last three months have, have taught me, reinforced uh, more than ever before, how quickly things can happen. Just how quickly they can. It's like an explosion. Uh, you know, it, it happens, and by the time you re realize what's happened, it's over. Uh, it was one day uh, with some, some uh, gentlemen playing around the golf, as a matter of fact, and the storm was coming up, and all of a sudden there was this uh, flash of lightning and this horrific boom of thunder overhead, and everybody but one man ran to a golf cart. And the guy who didn't run looked around and said, where y'all going? It's over now. That's how quickly things are happening, folks. By the time people realize what's happened, it's over. I believe we're the generation to see the return of the Lord. Pastor said something uh, last night at the close of the message that really uh, spoke to me. He said that in talking to God, that if we're gonna have a revival, then we're gonna need to we're gonna need to deal with our own hearts. Uh, we're gonna need to repent of things ourselves. Just prep our hearts for a move of God. I totally, totally agree with that. Uh, if we are gonna have a move of God. 
You know, God does, I've heard it all my life, that God doesn't pour his, his spirit, his blessings into a trash can. One day I was praying. I said, then God, you're going to have problems because it looks like the church is nothing but a landfill. We need a revival in our day. You probably, those of you who've heard me a number of times have probably heard me say that uh, Dr. Hughes said we've had a revival of tongues and gifts and, uh, you know, glossolalia, that kind of stuff. He said, but the one thing we haven't had in our day is a revival of righteousness. We need a revival of righteousness in our day. The book of Leviticus, chapter 6, if you have your Bibles, turn there with me, please. Uh, where we're looking, uh, this has been preached every way to Sunday, and I realize that. I'm probably the first to realize that since I'm the one preaching. Uh, but there is a, a road of revelation I'd like for us to follow tonight. If you would just uh, set your mental ship a sail with me uh, for the next little while. Not my intent to be long-winded. I told the folks, I believe it was last night, y'all can holler all you want to. I ain't preaching until 12. But if you'll go with me, there is something that is laying heavy on my heart. My wife, uh, she is notorious for asking me, what you preaching on tonight? I I, I started telling her the platform. So her first question tonight was, what you preaching on? Then she said, what message are you preaching tonight? Go with me for the next little while, if you will. The writings of Moses, Leviticus 6, verse 8, and the Lord. Spake unto Moses, saying, Command Aaron and his sons, saying, This is the law of the burnt offering. It is the burnt offering because of the burning upon the altar all night under the morning. The fire of the altar shall be burning in it, and the priest shall put on his linen garment, and his linen breeches shall he put upon his flesh, and take up the ashes. Notice that. Take up the ashes which the fire hath consumed with the burnt offering on the altar. He shall put them beside the altar. He shall put off his garments and put on other garments and carry forth the ashes without the camp unto a clean place. And the fire upon the altar shall be burning and it it shall not be put out. And the priest shall burn wood on it every morning and lay the burnt offering in order upon it. He shall burn thereon the fat of the peace offerings. The fire shall ever be burning upon the altar. It shall never go out. You would think, you would think, and I wouldn't disagree with you, that the most important thing in these verses seems to be the fire. The Bible says it's the law of the burnt offering. But there's not just a law of an offering here. There's another law in these few verses, and it is the law of the ashes for the next little while. I want to preach to you on that thought simply, the law of the ashes. May it please the Almighty to help us preach. You may be seated. Sit down, get comfortable, but please do not sit down on me. Help me for the next little while, if you will, please. The title of my message, again, is simply, the law of the ashes. Brother B.H. Clendenin was approached by a young preacher one time. Uh, this young preacher had gone through Brother Clendenin's school of Christ. It had absolutely changed his life. But he had watched other people who had attended that same school of Christ who uh, didn't walk with God long. They backslid, had ministries that never developed. Uh, and so the young preacher asked Brother Clendenin, told him what he had observed, and he said, uh, you know, th- th- this, this school of Christ changed my life. He said, I'm looking at others who don't seem to be changed. Uh, He asked Brother Clendenin, what is the reason for that? He said, Brother Clendenin said, the answer to that is easy, son. He said, the rest of that crowd went through the school of Christ. He said, in your case, the school of Christ went through you. There are folks all over America that are going through church. There's a handful that church has gone through them. Just a handful the church has gone through them. But when I was a young preacher, I was uh, getting started, and I started uh, maybe a little bit after 
a, a man whose picture I see hanging in your pastor's study. Uh, when I was a young preacher and Brother Jerry Oxendine uh, was evangelizing at that time, he was a hot commodity. He was, uh, in our area, one of the most sought-after evangelists uh, around. He and a pastor now, he was an evangelist at the time, Brother Kenny Locklear. They had ministries that were a lot alike, and these men uh, were, were on fire. They'd have, event, they'd have revivals uh, that would go for weeks, weeks. Power of God would move. People would be saved and sanctified and filled with the Holy Ghost. One of the reasons I uh, mentioned Brother Jerry Ox and I in his picture again hanging in the pastor's study is I know in addition to previous pastors and the current pastor and other evangelists who have passed this way, I know uh, that there has been, not that there isn't now, please understand me, don't preach it at me. Uh, I know that there's been fire in this church. I, there's a reason for my having said that, so hang on with me, if you will. The first time I guess ever heard the name Waimama, oh, it's a camp meeting uh, down in Florida. I guess the area is called Waimama, Florida. But Brother Hughes preached a camp meeting, been many years ago now, and that precious man of God is with the Lord now. But he preached a message, I think it's the night that he preached Jesus could come tonight. Now at the end of the message, the narrator said that into the wee hours of the morning, wave after wave of glory swept through that tabernacle. You could hear Brother Hughes when he was given the invitation addressing people standing in the darkness, in the shadows, outside of that tabernacle. And they said into the wee hours of the morning, wave after wave of conviction would sweep through that campground and people would come in out of that darkness and into that tabernacle and they'd give their lives to God. I'm talking about times when the fire of the Holy Ghost was burning. Brother Larry Hunt said to me when he was saved in 1974, I believe it was, he said to me, he said, Brother Jimmy, the churches were on fire back then. What I'm saying to you is simply this. There was a time when the move of God was so dynamic until the best way to describe what was going on is simply to say that the church was on fire. I don't know about you. I'm just speaking for one man. I'm speaking for myself, but I miss today what used to happen so often and so easily. I remember I could fast half a day and I knew we go have a blowout tonight. Now you struggle to fast a week and you're hard pressed. Listen, I'm just talking honestly. You're hard pressed to believe that anything is going to happen because folks have no real hunger for this thing. Many have never seen it. Uh, they, they don't know what others have seen. But listen, it is an inescapable fact that if you burn wood, ashes will be the result. That is inescapable. In that ancient economy, Israel would burn oil, but oil would leave no ashes. But when they would burn wood, every time ashes were left behind, oil is a type of the Spirit, a type of the Holy Ghost. He leaves behind no ashes. Wood is a type of man's works. And every time the fire of God touches the works of man, it will reduce them to ashes. It seems to me that common sense, just simple common sense, would dictate that ashes from yesterday's labors or last night's labors had to be dealt with and discarded. But God issued an order in Leviticus. He issued an order that every day they had to empty out those ashes. Every day. Something, listen, last night was good. Somebody texted me, how is the meeting going? I told them how good it is. I said, I'm enjoying it. But listen, folks, after last night, when the Spirit of God touches our best effort, the best thing you can do in the morning is clear out the ashes from every success, every victory, even every failure, and prepare for the fire into the day. 
Oh, God Almighty, help me here tonight. Now, it is believed and taught by some. I personally believe it myself that the initial fire that fell on the altar when Moses dedicated the tabernacle, that initial fire that fell came from heaven. It was started by God. God did the hard part. He started the fire. Man then after that had to protect and guard that fire and keep it burning. One threat to that fire was always ashes. If you get more ashes than you get fire, you're not going to have fire for very long. The thing that they had to do after that fire fell and because they were a nomadic people, they didn't stay in one place very long. They would camp out. They would stay for a while, but they always wound up moving. The thing I'm telling you is God sent the fire, but somehow or other they had to guard it and protect it. When they're traveling from one campsite to another, somehow or other they had to carry that fire and make sure that it never went out. One of the arch enemies to fire his ashes, the law of God concerning those ashes, was their removal. Every day, every day, every morning, they were supposed to remove those ashes. Here's what they did they removed the ashes from the altar. Wasn't the honky tonk, wasn't the Percocet dealer's house. You had to enter the altar, the, the ashes of the altar. From the tabernacle, that is, the house of God. They had to take them outside of the camp. Anybody hear what I'm saying to you? I need to make a statement. Now, I lived a lot of my life thinking that there was something wrong with ashes. I want to tell you tonight that there's nothing wrong with ashes at all. Just in case you hung up, pick the receiver back up. See, i got another hour to go, so don't hang up now. There's nothing wrong with ashes. You see, ashes are a byproduct. Ashes are simply a result. Ashes are the result of the fire of God having burned on that altar. Shout with me somebody. What's wrong with that? If there's anything wrong with it, then God is guilty because God started the fire on that altar. Nothing wrong with those ashes. They are simply a result, a byproduct. Ashes have history and they have language, a dialect and a mouth. They tell a story. Ashes in the church suggest, let me say it this way. You remember I mentioned Brother Jerry passing through here and the revivals he's had of the pastors uh, and, and this, pre, this current pastor. Listen to me. Ashes in this church. I'm not suggesting the fire has gone out. Take a fool and come in here and say that unless you knew God told you anything. Listen, ashes in this church suggest to me that this church is no stranger to the fire of God. Suggest to me that you're not afraid of the fire and that you're not ignorant of the fire. Some years ago, I guess back in the 90s, I'd gone to Baltimore, Maryland to preach in a district church of God. Stayed with the pastor that week. We walked into the house and immediately I knew there'd been fire in that living room. They had a fireplace. I knew also there's no fire now. How many of you know you can tell the difference when the fire is burning and when the fire has burned? I walked into his house and I knew there's no fire in that fireplace. But I also knew there has been fire around here. I'm telling you folks, you can go to places where there has never been fire. You can go to places where there has been fire. And you can go to places where there's a fire burning right now. Shout with me. I'm just saying to you folks, I've been around here long enough that I know if there's any ashes around here, it's because you have have the fire burning in this house. God help me. Where the ashes are found, I'm talking about this tabernacle now, where the ashes are found is the very spot 
where the fire one time burned and leaped upon that sacrifice. Where you find the ashes is where you would have found the fire had you been there sooner. Ashes declare that there was a fire in this very spot as late as yesterday, as late as last night, or as early as the birth of this church. You just can't tell how old the ashes are. Can't tell how old the ashes are. Something else you can't tell the age of. You can't tell the age of a fire. You can't look at a fire. Now I know y'all can look at me and, and engage my age. I know. But you can't look at a fire and gauge the age of the fire. Look at what it's concerned maybe. But you can't look at the fire. Fire's ageless. Fire is as young today as when the fire started some time ago. Here's, here's what I'm saying to you. Ashes declare that there was a fire here as late as last night or yesterday or as early as the birth of this church. It was a burning fire. It was a hot fire, a consuming fire. It burned hot enough. It burned high enough. It burned long enough. It burned until there was nothing left to feed the fire. Everybody with me? Listen, the only thing left in that tabernacle in the morning, if, 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 they, didn't, if they didn't keep checking it, the only thing left would be ashes. The ashes tell us a thing or two. They tell us that the fire did its assigned work. See, they'd put sacrifice on that altar and they'd put wood on that altar. And, and in the morning when they came to that tabernacle and they saw those ashes, the ashes say, the fire did its job. Shout with me, somebody. It says that the fire accomplished its mission and that it fulfilled its purpose generations saw it. I can tell you that, that along this way the times you've had revival in this church, there are generations that came through here and saw that older folks saw it. Uh, middle aged people, young people my boys have attended meetings where the fire fell. They're in their 30's and 40's tonight but those boys have seen the fire of God they may be walking around in ashes themselves but they know what it is for the fire of the Holy Ghost to fall in the middle of a service and go every direction. They know what that is. Every generation, all that fire, ashes say that the fire has run its course. But then ashes may say something a little more negative. Ashes may say that the fire burned out. They may declare that the fire has died out. The fire of God must be allowed to run its course. It must be allowed to completely burn through every one of us. It's the only way to rid us of self and flesh and the carnal nature. Shout with me somebody. Ashes are all that's left when the fire is all gone. But when, there, when there's nothing left but ashes, it says something is wrong. If all there is is ashes, see, they suggest something went wrong. They suggest something is missing here. The fire is gone. They suggest that something did go wrong. Two things I'll say to you right here. Number one, for the fire to burn low is negligent. For the fire to burn out is a crime against God. I'll say that again. Then see y'all swinging from the lights. For the fire to burn low is negligent. For the fire to burn out is criminal. God said the fire shall ever be burning. It shall not go out. 
I want to go back to something I said to you early on. Nothing wrong with, with ashes. There's nothing wrong with ashes unless and until they are not dealt with. If you leave them laying in the place where fresh fire is to begin, if you leave them where old fire died, I'm telling you, if you don't do anything with that, there comes some, the, the ashes aren't wrong. The act of not emptying them is wrong. The ashes themselves are not sinful. Ashes are at that time and at that place and at that condition between an ending and a beginning. Ashes are in the place of continuation. They're in the place of a fresh start. Here's what I'm telling you, folks. Ashes say to me, so long as that fire's burning, everything's going all right. But you let the fire go out, and that place is going to get dark and cold in just a little while. Ashes represent what's past. No, I dealt a little bit along those lines last night. They represent what was and what used to be. Even if the fire only went out yesterday, listen to me. Even if the fire only went out yesterday and we do nothing today about emptying the ashes and starting the fire, then yesterday becomes a week, a month, a year. And a year from the day, you can't tell how old those ashes are. You don't know whether the fire went out yesterday or a year ago. Shout with me, somebody. Shout with me, somebody. Listen, what's, uh, what's past isn't what's wrong. What's past wasn't wrong. But, but, but it benefits nothing if what used to happen is not happening today. Listen, everything about us, the, the will of God, the power of God ought to be producing ashes that we'll empty out in the morning. And the next morning we'll empty some more. And the next morning we'll empty some more. There should be a cycle of this. If you came here tonight with no ashes that need to be emptied out, all you're telling me is there's no fire burning on the altar of your heart. God help me. God help me. Ashes simply declare it's time for a fresh. We're not starting over. We come too far to start over. But it's not too late for a fresh start. A fresh fire, a rekindling. Fresh fire. You need to understand this. I'm, I'm, I'm not trying to talk to you like elementary. I know you, you're, you're people of the book, but fresh fire is an automatic. It doesn't happen on its own. If you know anything about your phone, your computer, apps and updates, you can set that device so that it automatically updates. Ain't nothing about this fire that automatically updates. If you don't manually update it, it will go out. I said if you don't manually update it, it will go out. I drove a bus when I was a senior in high school. At home, my family heated with wood. I'd get up early so that I could read my Bible before I got dressed for school and headed on that bus route. My mom would tell me every day just about now, you need to empty those ashes out before in the morning. You need to empty those ashes before in the morning. All right, I went into the mashes, go to bed, get up in the morning, it's cold, I need a fire. And I'm fighting ashes to start a fire. 
Now, where I'm from, we call it lighter. You might call it light wood. I don't know what you call it. Uh, you know that pine's got all that tar in that pine wood? Call it, we call it lighter. I'd, I'd light it, lay it down, and the ashes would suffocate it. It would go out. I believe there are a lot of lives that can't get a foothold, can't get a start, because they're trying to start a fresh fire in old ashes. Let me tell you what worked every time. It, you know, if I didn't do it last night, but I did it that morning, if I would take those ashes out of that heater, and if I'd give it a little bit of draft, and if I lit that lighter and laid it down, uh, you know that that air coming through would feed the fire, and it would catch. It'd start burning after a while. I had big pieces of wood. It, all I'm trying to tell you, folks, is the ashes say, until you do something about me, you've gone as far as you may go you've gone as far as you can go fresh fire is an automatic it doesn't happen on its own the fire starts with me but I've got to start with them ashes I've been in this thing 40 some years I was Born again, 1974. Started preaching, 1984. Went full time, 1989. So I've been around this a long time. But I'm telling you, fresh fire is going to start with me. But I've got to start with them ashes. I've got to start with them ashes. I've got to do something with that. Yesterday is ashes. We'll only choke out today's fire. You, you know what I've discovered? I've discovered that I've got to deal with ashes. And, and most of the time, those ashes are my works that have been burned up. See, sometimes, sometimes, folks, you might not shout amen here, but sometimes it's hard for us. It's hard for us preachers. If somehow or other we think we got a victory under our belt. A revival that went seven weeks. I mentioned that last night. A revival in the Baptist church where Wednesday, Thursday, and Friday nights there were 400, 500, 600 respectively. I doubt Wednesday, Thursday, and Friday I saw half the people, most of them were outside. Here's what I'm trying to tell you, folks. I'm trying to tell you when there is a visitation of God upon your life and you have what you might call a success or a victory, what you've got to do is deal with everything that God has burned up. You and I never did the work. If people get saved tonight, I can't save them. If they're sanctified, I can't sanctify them. If they're filled with the Holy Ghost, I cannot fill them. So in the morning, I'll have to empty the ashes of my own victory. Are you a singer? God touches you, uses you, blesses people. Folks get saved. Come out of darkness into light. You didn't do that. You were a vessel. The fire burned on the altar. But in the morning... You're going to have to empty those ashes from that victory. You're going to have to empty those ashes till there's nothing left but fire. Our work's out of the way. Nothing left but his fire. Everybody hear what I'm saying? I've got to deal with the ashes in my own life. Fresh fire, though, demands preparation. You know what's interesting among, among us Pentecostal folks? We think all we need is a red hot evangelist. You import somebody and have a prayer line runs from out of here to that highway. Gonna get some fire tonight. No, you just gonna kick around some ashes. Don't look at me cross eyed. See, 
uh, we, we're living in a time when it's like it's a competition between preachers who had the biggest number of people in his service. Who had the most saved or sanctified, filled the Holy Ghost, baptized, uh, you know, in water, that kind of stuff. Uh, you know what I found out? I found out uh, that this is not the NBA. This is not the NFL. This ain't tennis. We ain't playing golf. Anybody hear what I'm saying to you? This thing is all about the kingdom, folks. If, if, when, if when this thing is all over... If he had 10,000 folks saved, if I only had 500 saved, it ain't about how many got saved in his record or mine. It's did we add to the kingdom. Did somehow or other we snatch somebody out of the flames? Did we somehow or other lead somebody to Christ? Don't you folks ever get the tuck head? Because people don't pack your church out like they would if you brought Jason Crabb in here. I ain't going to tuck my head if you bring T.D. Jakes in here. I won't come, but I ain't going to tuck my head. Anybody hear what I'm saying to you? Bring Jensen Franklin in if you want to. I'm not going to get tuck head. I know what's going to happen if you bring him in. You think you got men working them doors and seating folks? You're going to need a baker's dozen parking cars along this road here. I might have told you this. I don't know. You go so many places, say so many things, you don't remember what you said was. But in our, our camp meeting at home a couple of years back, we had, well, they invited Pastor Jensen Franklin to come and preach. And, and, and he came. I'd already made up my mind, though. I ain't standing tonight. I know what happens when they do that. That place packs out. And you know, all church God people, they don't pay tithe on that thing. So I made up my mind, Brother Tim. I ain't standing tonight. I'll leave, go back to that motel before I stand. I got in there, walked into that vestibule, and I walked over to that back door going into the rear of that tabernacle. Usher met me at that door. You got a seat? I, no. You want one? I don't know if I'm staying. Then I thought about my offering. I'm not going to give it to just anybody to put in that bag. They may pocket it. So the executive secretary said, I got to go count money. If you'll sit here and watch my pocketbook. You can have my seat. I said, it's a deal. So I sat down. When I came in that night, brother, you could hardly buy a seat. They wedge you in there like mackerel and sardines between folks you don't even know. Had to park away from the building. And I came back the next night, brother Dean, looked like the rapture taking place. My wife said, you're going to need to quit, quit saying that. Ain't that many people going to go in the rapture. She ain't watching tonight, so I'll get away with it. I went by it the next night. I could park close to that tabernacle. Went in that same rear door of the vestibule to the back of that, to the back of that sanctuary. I looked in there, and I could see it just about anywhere I wanted to sit. You'd have to know the guy I'm talking about. Won't call his name, but his daddy was a church of God pastor. His brother is a pastor. And he looked around and said, well, Jehovah Jensen's gone. I, I'm, I'm not trying to be sarcastic. I'm, I'm, it actually happened. I'm telling you the truth. But listen, folks. What did they do the night before? I got a hunch that a crowd came in there and kicked around some ashes because if it was the real fire of God they were after, they'd have been back the next night. It wouldn't have mattered who was in the pulpit. If it was the fire of God they were pursuing, they'd have been back in that service. If 
there is going to be, in the event the fire burns out, if there's going to be fresh fire, if there's going to be a fresh start, there must be of necessity preparation. And preparation begins with emptying those ashes. They emptied the ashes, I'll say it again, not just out of that altar and out of that tabernacle, that house of God, but they took him completely out of the camp. Completely out of the camp. After they gathered him up and carried him out and put him, the Bible said they put him in a clean place. Put him in a clean place. I mentioned earlier, you know it wasn't because they, they'd been to the Percocet dealer's house. That, that, that's not what was burned up. It was good works that was burned up. So when they took the ashes out, they put them in a clean place. The ashes taken out of that house, discarded. And now that there's been a burial of that, now that that has been taken out of the way, we can build on what the ashes left behind. We can build on what the ashes left Now, you can't build a house with them ashes. But you can build on what they left behind. You can't build a fire with them. But if you get them out of the way, you can build a fire. Don't everybody shout at one time. One cannot mix ashes of the past with the wood of the present and start a fire today. Brother, I've been, I've been preaching stories of the past for a long time. I dealt with Smith Wigglesworth. I, I've dealt with David Brainerd and Robert Murray McCain and George Muller and Billy Sunday. You know, they said to Billy Sunday one time, they said to him, said, said Billy, said you, you just, said, you just rubbed the fur the wrong way on the cat. He said, no, I don't. Tell the cat to turn around. Brother, I've been rubbing the same way since 1984. Don't tell me I'm rubbing the fur the wrong way. Turn around, cat. They come too late to tell me, Brother Dean, that I got to change. They come too late to tell me that evangelists need to develop other skills because just preaching to our young people doesn't work anymore. They weren't there when a 16-year-old girl, not even from a Pentecostal church, said that's the best preaching I've ever heard in my life. They weren't there when a 20-something-year-old man said to me, Preacher, people like me need to hear preachers like you. Don't tell me I'm rubbing the fur the wrong way. Don't tell me I'm rubbing the fur the wrong way. You go in the churches, they got icicles in the pew and icebergs in the pulpit. No wonder they're doing nothing for the kingdom. Don't tell, don't tell me I'm rubbing the fur the wrong way. Y'all keep hollering like that. I might preach till 12 to 9. You, you know men serious and are serious and sober minded when they refuse to fall in love with their own ashes. They're serious. They're serious about a fresh outpouring of God when they refuse to fall in love with their own ashes. Brother Clinton and said, one occasion I think he's quoting somebody else, but said that a man's in trouble when he begins to believe 
his own propaganda. He starts believing how great he is, how good he is, how far he's come, all that he has accomplished. A man's in trouble when he starts believing his own propaganda. You know that the fire is about to burn when men and women and children join together and begin to empty the church, their lives, their homes, of the ashes when they begin to make room. Listen, folks, I think the church in America needs to begin to make room for the fire of God again. There's so much ash laying about. We need to do something that says to God, I refuse to fall in love with my ashes and I'm going to make room for the fire of God to fall in my life. Lift your hands and give God a mighty praise in this house tonight. Hallelujah. 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 I could share this with you in wrapping up. I tell folks my favorite preacher is a dead man, and so I do refer to him often. But Brother Clendenin had gone to San Antonio to preach a revival. He said when they walked in on a Saturday, he said to his wife, because ceiling had leaked, you know, ceiling tax was stained, bathroom stunk. He said, any time a church looks like that, you know you're in for a battle. He said to his wife, we're going to have a battle this week, honey. They did. He said it was dead. He said he'd preached all week. A few nights into that thing, said his wife, asked him, what are you doing? He said, what do you mean? She said, when you're going to pour in some oil, you haven't said a kind word to these people since you've been here. He said, I'll pour in some oil as soon as I wound them. I ain't hurt them yet. He said, as soon as I do, I'll pour in some oil. He preached to, through Saturday night, said to his wife, I'm going to pour in some oil in the morning. She said, I sure am glad. 4 o'clock, 4.30 in the morning, God woke him up. Said, don't you break bread with anybody till you break bread with me. He said, I knew what God was saying. He got up, started getting dressed. Wife woke up. What you doing? God's called me to the church. You come on with the pastor and his family. Said, on his way to that church, he's driving. God spoke to him. Your text will be somewhere in one of the epistles of Peter. He knew what, what, what. That verse said, and he said to himself, my wife ain't going to like this. He said from about 11.15 till about 12.20, he said it was like you turned on a faucet. He said he felt like he was standing outside of himself watching himself. He said, I was saying things, this back in the 40s or 50s, he said, I was saying things that you'd have thought, he said, I was preaching in this hour. He said, I was saying those things back in that day. He said, after about an hour and five minutes, hour and 15, something like that, he said, it's like somebody just turned the faucet up, just dried up. He said, the pastor told him, when you finish, don't call me. Just call these people to Come at, take communion. They've been dead all week. After he finished preaching, he said, now the pastor told me not to bother him. He, said, he told me just call you uh, to, to communion. He said, y'all just come on and let's do communion. He said, not a soul stirred. Nobody. He thought to himself, they didn't hear me. So he called him again. Nobody moved. He said that 
He put his knee to the left side. He was, he was going to make one more appeal. But when he sort of turned around, that pastor had been sitting in that, that pew about like Brother Shelton won't sit in there. And he thought, dear God, that man's left me. He said, when you, you can't see what you expect, you, you don't see what's obvious. He said, he turned around and that preacher wasn't in that seat. He crawled under that seat. So Brother Clinton said he went around and crawled in from the backside. He said, that preacher was a bawling. And he said, Pastor, what's wrong with these people? And that preacher said, son, Brother Clinton was a young man, and he said, son, you have killed every one of us. Brother Clinton and said, what are we going to do? The pastor said, I ain't doing nothing. Brother Clinton and said, well, I am. I'm getting mine, and I'm getting out of here. You owe me anything. You can put it in the mail. He said, he went back to that podium, and he called them people one more time. That's said for y'all to come on now if you're going to have communion. They never moved. He said he got this knee to the left side, and he said you'd have to go to hell to hear a scream like he heard. One man screamed in the back, stood up, had several ten or one hundred dollar bills. I don't remember now. And he said, said, I swore I'd starve him out. Through that money, on that, on that altar, and then people started getting up. One choir leader, one man going with three women, in that choir. He said they stood there till about 1, 2 o'clock in the evening. He said, I stood there till my feet went to sleep. Listening to all of that filth coming out of them people. Fire had gone out. And they stood there till about 2 o'clock while people emptied them ashes. He said nobody put it on the radio. They didn't have a telephone campaign. But when they got back to church that night, about 6 o'clock, he said the place was packed out. He said they weren't long into that service before a cloud came through that ceiling. Said it stopped just out of reach of a man's hand. And said, God filled everything in that house with the Holy Ghost. What happened? That preacher kept on rubbing that fur all week. Sunday morning, that crowd knew the fire had gone out. They emptied out the ashes. And Sunday night, God started a fresh fire. That's where the church is tonight. We need to empty the ashes so that God can start a fresh fire. Stand with me all over this house. Raise your hands and magnify God Almighty, would you? Stand all over this house. Raise holy hands. Magnify the Lord of glory. In this house, oh, magnify the Lord with me. Let us exalt his name together. Hallelujah, hallelujah, hallelujah. Hallelujah, hallelujah, hallelujah. Uh, talk to him, folks. Talk to him, folks. Hallelujah. He wants to start afresh and anew with us. He wants to do it all over again. Let's deal with the ashes. Let's empty out ashes tonight. Let's get rid of that so that God can start a fresh fire. If the fire's still burning, then deal with the ashes and throw more wood onto that altar. Yeah, lobo Hallelujah, hallelujah, hallelujah. Yeah, Not my brother, not my sister, but it's me, O oh Lord. Help me to deal with my own ashes. Help me to refuse to fall in love with my own ashes. Hallelujah, hallelujah. 
Hallelujah. Hallelujah. Hallelujah. Hallelujah. Hallelujah. Hallelujah. Come on, folks. He's moving among us tonight. God Almighty's moving among us tonight. Hallelujah. Meet him head on. Meet him face to face tonight. In this house right now, meet him face to face. Hallelujah. Hallelujah. The only time they turned their backs on that altar was when they emptied those ashes. But when they came back, they came back face to face with the fire of God on the altar. Hallelujah, hallelujah. Hallelujah, hallelujah. Pursue after him. Pursue after him tonight till your heart indicts a good matter. Till your tongue is as the pen of a ready writer. Till your bones feel like they're on fire. Help us tonight, God, help us tonight. Do it again, Lord. Do it again, God. Hallelujah, hallelujah. Hallelujah, hallelujah. Pastor said last night, not before, he said, if you feel like shouting, shout. The Holy Ghost moves on you. You mind him tonight. Hallelujah to God. Hallelujah to God. Hallelujah to God. Thank you, Jesus. Hallelujah, hallelujah. Touch us, God. Reach down in the sanctuary. Touch every, every one of us. Don't leave the pulpit exempt, God. Start with the preacher. Start with the preachers. God, and move toward every parishioner and every pew. Oh, God. Help us to safeguard no ashes. Help us to protect no ashes tonight. We cannot miss, mix yesterday's ashes with today's fire. Hallelujah, hallelujah. Hallelujah, hallelujah, hallelujah. Thank you, Jesus. Hallelujah, hallelujah. Hallelujah, hallelujah. Thank you, Jesus. Thank you, Jesus. Thank you, Jesus. Hallelujah. Hallelujah, hallelujah. Hallelujah, hallelujah. Hallelujah. I can't get to you tonight, saints of God, but he can. Nothing, nothing keeping the Holy Ghost from touching you where you are. Time and space does not prevent him from touching you right now. Hallelujah. Thank you, Jesus. Thank you, Jesus. Thank you, Jesus. Some happening here tonight, saints. Move with him. Move with him. Move with him tonight. Come on, come on. Hallelujah, hallelujah, hallelujah. Hallelujah, hallelujah.
Thank you, Jesus. Oh, God, consume us tonight. Consume us tonight. Hallelujah. 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 Thank you, Jesus. You keep worshiping God, 1990, San Antonio, Texas. Traveled to that city with three friends for General Assembly. Hadn't been ordained yet. One night in that assembly, they had a lady minister to pray. You could tell there's something different about that woman. After she'd spoken a word or two and had everybody to begin to pray, the first words out of that lady minister's mouth were, Oh God, consume carnality. Something went all through me. She wasn't there for show. She knew what it took to have a move of God. And so her first words were consume carnality. I felt the fire of God burn all through me. That's exactly, that's exactly what we need for God to do tonight. Consume. I need for God not to consume carnality in you, brother. I need him to consume it in me. I'll do this, and I'll step away. Would you, all over this house tonight, maybe we've already done it, let's just do it again. Would you? Let's lift our hands like the evening sacrifice. And let's just tell him, I've made room for the fire to fall again. Would you do that all over this house? Just really talk to him in your own way, but lift your hands. And let's just tell him, oh God, oh God, on this Tuesday night, the 7th of July, 2020, God, we've made room for the fire to fall again. Let it fall, God, and let it consume us. Let it consume carnality. Let it consume our worst works. Let it consume our best works. But, oh, God, let the fire fall on the altar of every heart, young and old. Hallelujah. Monday, baby. move with them saints, move with them saints. Hallelujah. May not be an earthquake here tonight, may not be a great wind, but if it's just a still small voice, that's God. Oh, let me go to bed. It's a still small voice, that's God. Oh, dear Hallelujah.
Come on, saints, lift your hands right now. Lord, set me on fire tonight. Feel me and refill me tonight, God. Why don't you just draw a circle around yourself right where you are and tell God to set everything inside that circle on fire right here tonight. God, just breathe. Breathe upon us tonight, God. Come on, church, lift your voice to him tonight. Set us on fire, dear God. Set us on fire here tonight, God. Let us have an upper room experience here tonight, Lord. Woo! Let the place be shaken where we are tonight, oh God. If you need to repent of things, repent of them right now. If you've neglected God, just make it right right now. If your fire hasn't burned like it used to burn, let's just make it right with God right now. Let's leave here on fire tonight. Let's leave this house. I want to see these pastors take it back to their local congregations. I want to see the fire burn in this pulpit. We need that fire, Brother Dean, back in the pulpit, we need that fire back in the teacher's stands. We need that fire back behind the instruments again. We need that fire back on the pews again. Need that fire back in the homes again. Need that fire back in our hearts that will make a difference out there in that world today. Oh God, how we need the fire of the Holy Ghost. John the Baptist said when he's come, He's going to baptize you with the Holy Ghost and with fire. A lot of folks claim to have the Holy Ghost, but not much fire anymore. I want that fire burning. How about you? I want that fire burning upon the altar and the fire to never go out, to never go out upon that altar. I, listen, I don't want to get in a hurry here. We ain't going to close this out. No hurry here. Let's just keep worship. Come on, just keep worshiping the Lord. I don't believe God's done here. I don't believe God's finished here yet. Tell him, Lord, set me on fire. God, let me deal with the ashes in my life tonight, Lord. Oh, that you can start a new fire. That you can start a new fire in our lives here tonight. This thing started in the fire. In Acts chapter 2 on the day of Pentecost. And it will not survive in the smoke. I don't know how somewhere along the way we got satisfied with smoke. But it began in the fire. We need that fire burning like never before in this generation, this hour. 
I don't know, you know, I'm not trying to be rude, but I get tired of going to dead, dry services. I get tired of going to dead, dry revivals. I get tired of going to dead, dry camp meetings. And then everybody leave and say, what a wonderful service we had. I'm thinking, dear God, was you in the same service as I was in? I didn't feel any. There was nothing there in that service. We need that kind of Pentecostal fire burning in our hearts again. If we're going to be Pentecostal, we might as well be on fire, saints of God. I said, if we're going to be Pentecostal, we might as well be on fire. That early church wasn't just a Pentecostal church. She was a wholeness church. And that produced a fire, a power in her. And I believe if we'll deal with the ash in the church today, I believe we'll have that kind of fire burning again. They say, well, that's, you know, that, that's, that's from way back yonder. That's old school. That's, that's old time stuff. But I believe there's a lot of ash in the church that's got in there that the fire don't burn like it used to in a lot of places. I'd rather have the fire than the ash. How about you? Rather have the fire of the Holy Ghost burning in the church. Brother Oxendine said one time in this church, preaching revival, he said, you know, I guess if I'd never known it, I could live without it. But I've known that kind of power. And I've known that kind of fire. And he said, I can't live without it. No more than a fish can't survive outside the water. We can't live without the fire of the Holy Ghost. I'm not talking about this, all oh, this, you know, this, this neo-Pentecostal stuff. I'm talking about the real power, the real fire of God that changes people's life, that brings conviction with it, that men feel, feel guilty before God and want to make right with God Almighty. I guess if I'd never known it, I guess I could live without it, Brother Tim, but we've, we've known that power said it before in this church, I don't want my kids, my children to grow up and not know the power of God that I've known, that I know. When my grandchildren get here, Brother Benny, if they do, years down the road, maybe not so many, I don't want my grandkids to grow up in a church where there's no power, where they don't know what it is to see people healed, people fall under conviction and be saved. People be sanctified. People be baptized with the Holy Ghost and fire. I don't want my kids and, and grandkids to grow up in a place where, there's, where it's just dead and cold as ice in there. I, I concur with Brother Oxendine. If I had never known this fire, maybe I could live without it. I don't know. But I know what it is, and I don't want to try to survive without that fire of God. And you give him a hand of praise, a large hand of praise tonight. Ah, I feel the Holy Ghost in this house tonight. Feel that anointing here tonight. The Holy Ghost doesn't just make the difference. The Holy Ghost is the difference. John said, I'm going to baptize you with water, but he's coming after me. He's going to baptize you with the Holy Ghost and fire. I don't want to just settle and say, well, these are just the times that we're living in. I don't want to just settle and say, well, you know, we just can't have a move of God like we used to have a move of God. I believe the Bible said he's the same yesterday, today, and forever. He's not changed. What he did in that early church, I believe he can do the same thing in this Latter-day church. If I don't believe that, I need to lay the Bible down and go get me a job and do something else. I believe what God did then, God can do right here and right now. I think the problem is too much ash. I said, I think the problem's too much ash today. But if we can deal with the ash, turn me on right here, brother. If we don't, I'm going to preach, so turn me on right there. If we'll deal with the ash, I believe God will send the fire again. I want that Holy Ghost power, don't you? I want that kind of Holy Ghost power in our services. I don't want to leave and say, we had a wonderful, wonderful service. That was great singing. Good, good message. And God never be in the building. One preacher said 90% of what goes on in the churches, if the Holy Ghost was removed, if the Holy Ghost, 90% would continue on just like nothing ever happened, nothing ever changed. But it's the Holy Ghost that convicts. Men don't convict, the Holy Ghost convicts. It's the Holy Ghost that will change a man's life, change a man's direction. The Holy Ghost will convict a man or a woman. 
The Holy Ghost can do more in just a few minutes than we can do all day, Brother Tim. How many want that kind of power and that kind of fire? It'll cost you everything to have it, but if you'll pay the price, we'll have it. How many, we're going to go home. How many would agree with me that the churches today are not like they were years ago? That's one of you back there. When I was coming up back in the 70s in church, they had church back then. I mean, you didn't have people looking at it, you know, like a calf looking at a new gate. I mean, when people come in, they want to have a move of God. And if you didn't have a move of God, we didn't have church. God's not changed one bit. He's still the same, and God still desires to do that in his church today. I, I, want, that, I want that in the church today, don't you? We're glad you came tonight. Aren't you glad you came? How many, how many God's touched you this evening and helped you here tonight? Let's give him one more hand before we go home. I don't have to worry about being politically correct. I'm not running for anything. I'm not jockeying for any kind of position. I want to see that kind of outpouring again. And we've been praying for a great awakening again. That will change the church. That will affect the communities. That will affect this nation again. If it's going to happen, it's got to start with the church. And if it happens in the church, something will happen outside the walls of the church. Amen. Amen. We're glad you came tonight. Thank you for wherever you are from. All of our visitors, West Ashboro, Big Oak. Did I miss Lights for Christ, Holiness Church? I miss anybody else. Roanoke Rapids. These are our family here. Wherever you're from, God bless you for being here tonight. Don't forget about service tomorrow night. And we still on here? Okay, I'll say this carefully. If you have a home church, it's all right. Come back here tomorrow night. No, don't do that. <laughs> I'm kidding, Pastor. But if you don't have a home church, come back here tomorrow night. We're back here looking for God to do something great again. Amen. Let's stand to be dismissed. May the Lord bless you. If you will, wait on the ushers, please. They're going to come and escort you out just like they brought you in. Ushers, if you'll get ready, please. Appreciate the message and the messenger. Enjoyed this time we've had together in the house of God. Let's keep praying for our churches. I pray for them every single day that God will send revival to us. Let it, I pray, God, let it start right here in South Ashboro. Let it happen down the road and up the road. And churches all over this nation, around this world, God, send us revival. We need a revival. The Lord's going to come. And uh, we need an outpouring of the Spirit of the Lord, don't we? Need that fire to burn. Amen. Brother Tim Dean, I love him. He's one of my best friends on this earth. And uh, I know what you thought. You, you think he's, you know, he's, he's almost like a dad to me. He's been like a father to me through these years. I think so. <laughs> he'll get me back. I'm going to be preaching for him in October, I think. And uh, He'll get me back somehow, but I love him so much. Brother, Brother Floyd, I love this man of God. I'm just so thankful that they're able to be with us tonight. Brother Tim, if you don't have COVID, I want you to come up here. <laughs> don't breathe on me. Don't look at me. <laughs> That's right. Appreciate him and his family. They drove three hours. Listen to me. They drove three hours to be in service with us tonight. They're going to get back in that car and drive three hours back home. He's got a funeral to help do in the morning. But they drove three hours to be in this service tonight. I, I appreciate that. I, I, I appreciate that. I appreciate that. These folks love the Lord. Amen. You drive three hours to be in church. You love God. I said you love the Lord. Amen. So, well, come on, brother. Pray our closing. What a joy that it is to be in the house of God. Amen. I do love him because he first loved me. I was praying the other day, Brother Floyd, and you know, this is a dangerous thing, uh, Pastor, to get somebody up here after this kind of preaching tonight. Um, makes me want to preach. Yeah. But I, I just thank God, uh, Pastor Floyd, that, that he loved me when I was unlovable. He saved me when, in, you know, in the, the sight of man and how we view things. He saved me when I was unsavable. Delivered me when I was undeliverable. I thank him that he loves us tonight. He's, he's not going to throw the clay away, is he? He's still working on us. But as Brother Jones reminded us tonight, there's a work we've got to do. And when we do that, God will always do his part. Amen. Don't you love him? One more time, can we bless him as we close in prayer tonight? <clears throat>
Hallelujah. Amen. If you would, let's bow our heads and our hearts before the Lord. Heavenly Father, thank you again for the privilege you've granted us to come together tonight in your house. Thank you for each and every one that's assembled here tonight from wherever that they may be. God, I pray for all the home folk here at South Asheboro. God, for this, this messenger, this, this pastor, uh, this one that leads this local assembly, that you would continue to anoint his life and the leaders here, God, and everyone that's a member and an attender, God, that that fire burns in and, and all of our hearts and lives, God, that it'll burn higher and hotter than ever before, that it'll never wane, but just daily increase and intensify as we remove those ashes and we create room for the, the fresh fire of God in our hearts and in our lives. Continue to bless Brother Jones. Continue to anoint him and strengthen him, O oh God, to uh, do the work that you've called him to do. And Lord, may we never fail to remember to keep our eyes on those eastern skies, knowing that, that soon and very soon you're coming and we want to be ready, oh God. And help us to help someone else to know you so that we'll forever be together in heaven. Protect us tonight as we travel, as we go to our respected homes. God bless the remainder of this revival and we'll praise you for all that you've done, all you're doing, and all you're going to do. For we ask it in the precious and most powerful name of the Lord Jesus Christ. Amen. And all God's people shouted, Amen. Amen. was feeling and the emptiness I tried so hard to hide though I laughed and said my life was fine without you I was covering up the secret tears I cried then one day Someone told me of your mercy And the love you showed on a hill called Calvary There you died and Purchased my redemption When you broke sin's power And set my spirit free I'm a It's true, there have been days when I failed you. Lord, you know the many times I've gone astray. But I've learned your love is stronger than my weakness. And your ear is open every time I pray. ever cared for me like you, Lord. Other friends can never be as close to me. I'm not afraid to face the problems of tomorrow. Knowing you are everything
Got my part of 